What is up amigos? Today we're talking about oil film flow viz. We'll be going through what it is, what it shows in the flow, general formula for it, the limitations of it, and alternative formula which you can really use to exaggerate some sort of flow features and highlight what's going on. So first of all, what is it? Well, looking at these pictures, we get a pretty good idea of what it is and what it does. So it literally is just exactly what it sounds like. It's this oil film, it's this oil mixture that you apply to a surface with a paintbrush usually, and then you run the flow over it. So for example, in this picture down here, we have a cylinder and we're looking down from on top and we have the flow going from left to right. So this is exactly the setup. So if we look from the side, we have a cylinder coming off the wall and we have the flow going along here. And the researchers here have painted the surface that the cylinder is mounted to, as well as the cylinder. And in this picture, we see a lot of different flow features. And this gives a really good idea as to how powerful oil film flow viz is in terms of illuminating to us what is happening in the flow. So right here, we see very line, it's straight. And then on either side of this line, there is this flow that's going either to one side or the other. This is the point at which flow is being divided. And then from here, the flow goes around the cylinder. So already this oil film flow viz has shown us so much in terms of the flow physics. But there's even more to that because as the flow gets closer and closer to the cylinder, you can see it gets more curved, first of all. And then secondly, there's now this really thick line, this curved line here, that segregates the flow from upstream to the flow very close to the cylinder. So what is happening is the flow comes along here, it hits the cylinder, and then it's trying to move out of the way. But the more you keep throwing flow in, so you keep throwing flow into here, there's flow pushing back, and this results in a standoff line right in the middle here, this, this curved really white line that then by, like divides the flow into two halves again, the flow going around and then the flow very close to the cylinder. So that's again another massive flow feature we can see just from the cylinder. Then behind the cylinder, we can see that this white line that again divided the flow means that no flow from outside this white line is coming in into the wake and no flow, flow from inside the wake is going out. Then behind the cylinder, we have these two white dots. Now from this picture, we can't tell exactly what they are, but they probably are vortices. And at the very least, they are some liftoff points. So what's happening is that the flow comes along here, hits these points, and then lifts off and comes out of the flow. That's probably what's happening. So from this one picture, we see so much of what is happening in the flow. And that is how powerful oil film flow this is. And you can find out even more than this. This is just one example. For example, in this picture here, we have, I'm guessing this is an airfoil, NACA 4415, and the flow is going from left to right, and we have this onset of this flow separation, so we have an LSB forming. So one way that we can tell this without having all these annotations from the researchers which have illuminated this for us, is if you look at this flow here, so if you just were to do this experiment and you got this picture and you have to interpret what's happening here, look at these lines. So you can see that you dotted the oil on this surface, which is another technique, you get the brush and you flick it on to the surface as opposed to painting it on. The benefit of this is now the lines show that the flow has been going over this region as opposed to the dots, the flow is far um, less, it's far slower. So the flow is not taking the fluid as much, which means that this, these fluids, these little dots are remaining crisp. So that means we can safely conclude that these regions, either side of this really crisp region is seeing fast moving flow. And we also see at the back and even at the front, we have quite thick white lines. That tells us that this is a segregated region from the rest of the flow, and this is most likely an LSB, a laminar separation bubble. And that's a dead giveaway with these crisp dots. So again, just by how you apply this oil film, you can get a lot of information about what's going on. And also there is there are some other pictures which show different things. For example, this is another airfoil and we get some sort of separation happening along here. So using oil film is a super powerful technique and it's, you should be doing it really. So what is the general formula for this liquid that you need to apply to the surface, whether you paint it on with a brush or you flick it on with a brush? What do we use? Well, there are quite a few different formulas, formulae, but um, the most common one I would say that you find in textbooks are kerosene, and then you have linseed oil or flax oil, and even sometimes diesel oil. I prefer linseed oil because it's, as far as I know, it's not toxic at all. It's completely safe. Uh, other things, you know, you might have to consider, but I like linseed oil or flax oil. And then you use talcum powder. 
So let's talk about each one of these individually and their ratios. So first of all, kerosene. So kerosene is a pretty nasty liquid, but unfortunately we have to use it. And I'll go through later on an alternative formula that you don't use it in, which is really nice. I use that instead. But generally speaking, kerosene, this is a very um, runny liquid. So it runs very quickly. If you were just to paint this on a regular surface with nothing else, run the flow, it would then get taken away happily, like no problem at all, no resistance almost. Now, linseed oil, that provides the viscosity to the liquid. So that means that if you were to paint it onto a surface and run the flow, it's going to be a little bit of resistance, which is good because that will then highlight the flow a little bit more where it's going. Then you have talcum powder, which is the thing that will actually illuminate what is happening. So this white that we see in these pictures, that's the talcum powder that you can see. And the reason why we use talcum powder is because it is really fine and it will suspend in the liquid. We want something that will suspend because that means that it will get taken with the liquid and that will highlight where the flow is going. If the stuff that you put in there, so if you were to use really high density stuff or it's really big granulated, it's going to fall out and it's not going to go anywhere. So you won't be able to see anything. Talcum powder is a great candidate. Now in terms of the ratios that you mix together, what are they? Well, in textbooks, generally you'll find something around about five to two to one. So if you were to put in like one liter of talcum powder, two liters of linseed oil, five liters of kerosene, and if you were to do that, that would probably last you your entire lifetime of oil film. Maybe not so much, but it's a lot. You do usually use like 100 mils of kerosene and go from there. So the reason why this formula is about what we might usually use is because if we go thicker with, if we go more with the linseed oil, the overall formula will be thicker, which means that it won't run as much. There are some uses for that, which we'll go for through in a second, but that's just what usually happens. If we go less with this, it means that the uh, liquid will be runnier. And that means that uh, you may just have them running everywhere and you won't see the flow nearly as well. And in terms of kerosene, again, if you were to make this less, then it would become thicker. If you were to make this more, it would become uh, thinner, it would run more. So what are the uses of this? Well, I mentioned that this is the general formula, but I've run this even down to two, two, one, and it works fine. So the reason why you can run it at different ratios is depending on the flow. So in terms of the velocity, this really can dictate what you can use. So if the velocity is higher, it means that there's going to be more uh, shear stresses in the flow. There's going to be a lot more, um, the flow is going to be pulled apart more with the force of the velocity going over. So that means that you don't necessarily need to have such a runny fluid. You can get away with a much thicker fluid and you'll still see all these different patterns because the flow will still take it away because it has enough force to do so. Or alternatively, if the velocity is much slower, so like one meter per second or less, then you want to have a runnier flow because there isn't as much force from the air pulling or moving the fluid around. So if you go for a thicker fluid in this case, then you won't really see as much. You want to go for a bit of a thinner fluid. So that's the general way that you would gauge that. But if you were to stick to any of these kind of ratios, they work pretty much 99% of the time. Now, in terms of limitations, now we get to two main factors. The first one is, does this oil affect, does this liquid affect the flow over the object that I have? Well, the short answer is yes. The long answer is, in my experience, not really. Um, and I'll explain what I mean by that. So I've used this on quite a few different surfaces. And probably the most delicate surface I've ever used it on is an airfoil. So let's say I have an airfoil and we're looking down from on top and we have it running at like 200,000 Reynolds number and a temp intensity of like 0.5%. That's prime territory to get an LSB forming, a lateral suppression bubble. So what happens is the flow goes along here, separates, then reattaches, and now it is turbulent. It, it transitions to turbulence as it goes over this region. Then this region here is just this recirculation zone. So the flow just keeps going around and around and around and it doesn't escape. The reason why I'm bringing this object up and this flow up is because this is a very delicate flow feature. If you were to change the Reynolds number, surface roughness, terms of intensity, velocity, even a little bit, it would change the LSB and potentially even make it not form. Now I've run it with this, with uh, this formula approximately, and I've also done CFD on this exact same thing. And the LSBs that I found were almost identical, like, <laughs> like close to within like a few millimeters. So yes, oil film should theoretically change the flow features a little bit, but in practice, not so much. I mean, if you, what you see is pretty much what you'll get even with no flow oil film on there. So it's a pretty robust technique. 
The second limitation is gravity. So in this situation here where we had the cylinder, let's look at this again. We have the cylinder here upright and we have gravity now pulling down the flow at certain points. So we see that this cylinder is upright, gravity is acting down. If I were to paint this object, naturally gravity, gravity will be pulling the flow down. So if I were to run the wind on here, there will be a combination of the force from the air pushing or pulling the flow around and then gravity pulling the flow down. So the streamlines will start to coalesce and you'll get like this um, like murky region. It's not gonna be very crisp. What are some ways around this? The first way is by actually orienting, orientating your object in a way that gravity won't affect it as much. So for this airfoil here, instead of having it out of the page, having it flat. That way gravity isn't really affecting the flow on this surface too much and the film here. So you're going to get a much crisper image and you won't get gravity corrupting results. The second way is by changing your formula. So you can crank up the linseed oil or flax oil or flaxseed oil or diesel oil, whatever you're using, so that it becomes a lot more viscous. That way gravity won't play as much of a role. That means you just need to run the flow a lot more and it's for the liquid to get taken to where it needs to go. So that's the second limitation. Now, in terms of how you were to use this information, there are a few different ways that you can go. The first way is you were to paint the surface and then you just run the flow until it dries. And then from there, you can take this entire object off, put it in your shelf or whatever it is, use it later to analyze and get information about. I personally don't like that way because um, even though the flow will, that the oil will dry, it sometimes still is not completely dry, so you can smudge it and corrupt your results. So that's not a very robust way. The second way that I've seen and uh, is pretty good is you then like pay, like put what we call in Australia contact, which is like this plastic sheet that you can just put on something and it makes it plasticky now. And you use this black contact, so this black plastic sheet that you can stick onto the surface and then you paint that surface. Then you run the wind tunnel until it dries and then you peel off this black plastic and then you put it over somewhere and then that way you can sort of preserve it a bit better and it's not so prone to get smudged. Now the reason why I'm talking about like these different colors, if you were to use black plastic that goes well with talcum powder because that's why so there's a huge contrast. If you were to use a different heating particle which we'll go through in a second then maybe a different color would be good to contrast. You'd probably use the color wheel to get the op opposite um, color on the other side of the wheel. So anyway, that's the second way of preserving this information. The third way, which is the way that I prefer and I always do, is I use cameras. So as I'm running this wind tunnel, I have a camera wherever I'm interested in. So if I want to look at the side, I have a camera to the side pointing at an object from the top or from a three quarter angle out of the flow so it doesn't affect the flow and take pictures as you're running. This I prefer so much more for a couple of reasons. One is robust, so you have these pictures now that's they're not gonna get affected, doesn't matter what happens from now on. This can be corrupted, you got your pictures, you're great. The second reason is that you can sort of track how the flow is progressing as the wind comes along it. So you can sort of see these, these flow features developing and that can sometimes give you information about what is happening. So I prefer this third method way better. So let's get into alternative formulae now. So to look at this alternative film formulae, let's look at some other pictures here. You can see that we have white ones, a lot of white ones, they're great, they show a lot of information. But you can see some blue ones here. This one's really cool. You have uh, blue, red, green, yellow, a bunch of different colors. Uh, you have green here, you have even red and blue and red here. How do you get these different colors? Well, there are two main ways that I've investigated. Um, the first way uh, was with some glow-in-the-dark particles. Uh, I contacted some manufacturers of glow and dark particles, as you can imagine, they actually do exist. Talked about it, and unfortunately, that's not a great way to go. The reason why is because the smaller the particles become, the manufacturers said the less illuminate, like less luminescence they give off as you put them in the dark. So the lowest that they we looked at were 50 microns, which is really small. I mean, you think they're tiny, but the problem with these particles is that they are usually very dense and they fall out of the liquid very quickly. So you can paint this onto your object and then run it and then all you'll see is these dots are still there because they haven't been moved by the fluid because they've dropped out and you don't see anything really. So glow and dark particles don't really work. The second far more common way is using a, a photoluminescent dye. So what that means is 
usually under regular lighting conditions, it doesn't look like anything. But once you shine a UV light on there, then it starts to glow differently. So this picture here is, as I say, with UV light. So without UV light, this would probably just look white, but then with the UV light, you get all these different colors. And this is in the dye. So you can find a dye that you can put into with this and you can play around with different ratios depending on where you get the dye from and get stronger or fainter light. So that's another formula to really make your pictures pop. And because we have color pictures now, it's great. If you were like 50 years ago, or 80 years ago, maybe it wouldn't be so great, but here it's great. Another formula that I've come across and I've actually developed because I didn't like using kerosene so much. I always think on kerosene afterwards and people always complained going home and that, and even at, at uh, work. And I didn't like using kerosene so much because it's a very harsh liquid. I came up with another formula, which as far as I know, I haven't seen it ever before, but I mixed ethanol with talcum powder together. And the reason why I use ethanol is because it dries super quick. So one major benefit of this is that you can paint your surface, run it very quickly and take pictures or even video as it's happening. And you can see where the shear stresses are qualitatively speaking. So let's say I have this wing again and I paint this entire surface with this ethanol talcum powder mix. Now in LSBs, I know just from theory that the shear stress is much lower here because the velocity here is much lower. This LSB is very slow moving fluid. So the fluid near the wall is very slow. Outside of this LSB, the flow is much faster. So that means the shear stresses are higher, which means that drying times are quicker. The faster the shear, the high the shear stress is, the faster the drying time will be. So what you'll see is as you continually take pictures or video of your object as the flow goes over it, is that these regions will dry very quickly. This region won't, or relatively speaking. So now you can say, okay, well in this region, there's lower shear stress, what's going on here? And then you can investigate that further. So that gives you qualitative information about your shear stress. Alternative, in addition to that, because the, fo the formula here dries so quickly, you get really, really high quality pictures where you can see tiny little features that you don't get with regular oil film flow viz because regular oil film flow viz is just very heavy handed in terms of everything smudges together. It doesn't dry very quickly. The alcohol mix, because it dries so quickly, you get really like, you can see microscopic detail. That's how awesome the detail is. But the problem is that it dries very quickly. So in terms of how you use this, you make your formula up, you paint your object, and as soon as you do that, you hit the wind and you take pictures because it's going to dry within seconds. In terms of the mix, I usually use anywhere between two to five to one. You can play around with this and see, it's not really a uh, very difficult ratio here because there's only two parts to it, uh, but that's what I usually use. So that is oil film flow viz in a nutshell and so much different information about how to use it, different formula. If you like this video, make sure to click the like and subscribe button and I'll see you soon. Peace amigos.